Now go ahead and turn into 1 Peter chapter 2. This week in uh, chapter 2, Peter's going to reveal to us who we are in Jesus, guys. Who we are in Jesus individually, as individuals, and also as the church. What Jesus calls his church. See, Peter knew for this early church, he's writing these letters to all these regions there and to all these churches in the regions. He knew that the early church identity would be important, who they are. Now, there were many Jewish converts, and so there were the Jewish believers, and then there was the Gentile believers also. Now, the Jews, the Jews had proclaimed their identity prior to Christianity in the things like the temple. The priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all these types of things, the Old Testament writings, the law of Moses, they found their identity in that. We find our identity in that priest who's doing the sacrifice. We find our identity in that beautiful temple there, right? That building they built. Now, the Gentile in the time of Peter, their identity was kind of given to them, though. It was given to them by the Jews, right? They were pagans. They were atheists. They were heathens. They were just filthy, you know? And the ones that were Samaritans, they were Samaritans. It was given to them. Both would need to know, and Peter knew this, both would need to know the new identity and that identity in Jesus, individually again and a whole and collectively as a church. You know, the question would be, even for us today, well, what is the church? How do we, what is the identity we give to the church? It's very important, guys, it's very important, church. Is the church a, a name? You know, Calvary Chapel, New Day, is that the church? Is the church a, maybe a denomination, Baptist or Protestant or Methodist or whatever? Is that the, is that the church? Is it a building? You know, we're within the building here. We're in the church. Is it a group? You know, a group of people. Well, we could say to an extent it's a group of Christians, but the church is really us, us individually. Like I say, maybe the church is a group that has a 5013C given to us by the federal government. If we don't have one of those, y'all can't be a church. I'll tell you something here for Calvary Chapel New Day. I care less about that kind of thing. But what it achieved us was ability with the probation office to be able to allow those in this community have to do community service to come do it here at the church. That's the only reason we got it. I cared less about anything else. It was to help our community, you see. It wasn't to help us. God takes care of that. Well, maybe the church is just a place of worship, you know. How do we identify it? And then we got to look at, and Peter will speak about, what about our personal identity? Who do we identify ourselves as? Are we just identify ourselves as Christians or maybe members of the church, right? If you'll notice, Calvary chapels do not have membership. We don't keep a membership here, never have, never will. If you love the Lord Jesus, he's a member, okay? He's a part of us. If you love Jesus, there's your membership. But maybe we considered in a, in, in a, you know, a membership or something of that nature or just call ourselves believer. What is our personal identity? Who is Jesus to you? Who are, who are you in Jesus, I should say? What is that identity? Who are you in God's eyes as that Christian? Who are you in a really a spiritual realm before the Lord? What is your identity? You know, Paul proclaims his identity. I love this scripture in Galatians 2.20, guys. And Paul pulls this identity. And I've used it for myself even. I like to steal it from him, you know. But he wrote it first. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Can we live in the identity of Paul, maybe? Say, hey, that's, that's my identity. Or let Paul identify us for ourselves, if you know what I mean. You know, sometimes we can find our identity in, uh, in our ministry or in our works. What we do. What we do for the Lord. Well, I'm an usher. I'm a greeter, you know. I'm a children's church teacher. I'm a board member. I'm a worship leader. All these things you find your identity in. Well, I'm an elder. Hey, you know what? I'm a pastor. 
Find your identity in that. No, that's not where our identity is. Not at all. You know, years ago, due to some circumstances, my wife and I chose to leave Calvary Chapel Prescott. Guys, we'd been there 18 years. I loved that family. I knew just about everybody. I was there for three services every Sunday, Wednesday night. I knew them all, man. And these were my brothers and sisters. I loved them dearly. And it was very hard pulling away. But you know one of the hardest things to pull away from? Was my identity and all sorts of other stuff. My identity as head of ushers and greeters. My identity as the, the uh, men's ministry leader. My identity in being, being on the leadership in the, in the church. All these things I had my identity in. And it was like, and same for my wife. She was part of the, you know, the ladies' ministry, and she did like there uh, some accounting and stuff for them. And I was like, oh, my goodness. You know, I'm going to pull away from this. This is our identity. Anyway, we had left there, and sometime later, we were without a church for like four months. I never advise that for anybody. Do not be without fellowship for that period of time. Not good. So, but we're gone for a while, and I'm just praying, you know, and it's a real bummer. I don't have all this, you know. And Jesus just spoke to me so clearly. He says, your identity, Dennis, is in me and me crucified. Your identity is in Jesus Christ and him alone. Much like Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live. That's where our identity is to be. It's only to be in Jesus, guys, not these other things. See, Peter knew that in that identity would be important, though, for these churches in a time of persecution. The persecution was going to be coming upon these church. Whether a Jewish believer or a Gentile believer really didn't matter. Each needed a new identity, and that identity had to be strong. Identity in a personal relationship with the Lord, so important. Jesus and him crucified, church, that where your identity is. That personal, and as a whole also. Because he knew these churches needed to be able to stick together. And they needed, to be, they needed to strengthen one another. As individual Christians and also as a church, they needed that. The strength in each, their identity, would, would rely on the other. Do we understand that? The strength of the church in whole, the numbers of members, would rely on the individual strength of each and every individual also. Persecution would try and divide, scatter, and separate. I'm telling you, the persecution that will come upon the church in our nation will try to scatter and separate those. That is the work of the enemy, to scatter and separate. Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10, be on the screen, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall... One will lift up his companion. That is the strength. That is the strength of another Christian, whether it's one or a hundred, right? One will lift up his companion, but woe to him who's alone. You're separated when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Peter knew, like I say, individually, these believers could be at risk as an individual Christian. They needed their identity. They needed the strength of the group and of the of the whole, the whole church, if you want to put it that way. And they all had to have the same identity. They had to be of the same one accord to be strong that way. To find faith in Jesus and their strength there. Ecclesiastes 4.12, it says, Though you may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. Though you may be overpowered by another, no, you got your... You got your Christian brother, you can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Jesus as that third cord. By the way, we always speak about that in marriage, right? You got a husband, you got a wife, and that third cord that makes that marriage strong is God in your marriage, Jesus Christ within that marriage. Otherwise, those two cords can get broken pretty easy. Identity has to be in Christ. He is what Peter's going to speak about is the foundation, the cornerstone. 1 Corinthians 3.11, Paul writes, For no other foundation can anyone lay than which is laid, which is Jesus Christ, you see. And Peter's going to speak about that this morning. 
how Jesus is our foundation, our cornerstone. And he's going to be a strength in trying times for these churches back in Peter's time. Peter told us, come and trust, trust in the Lord. Live and build. He's going to tell us to build upon a cornerstone, Jesus. Amen. Let's pray and we're going to get into this morning's message. Father, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the rock we stand on. Lord, we stand upon a rock. We stand upon the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Lord, individually and collectively, we make up each one of those stones, Lord. And thank you, God, that you are that cornerstone and you strengthen us. Bless the reading of your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So with all that saying identity, the title of my message this morning is Identity in Jesus. Please, church, find your identity in the Lord. You know, in verse 1 through 3, we caught that last week. Uh, Peter told us to lay aside a lot of things. Let me just read it. He said, therefore, laying aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all evil speaking, he told us as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So he told us to lay it basically, lay aside our old selves, right? Lay those things aside. The worldly us, get rid of those things. Lay aside the anger, lay aside the deceit, lay aside the hypocrisies, lay aside the envy, lay aside the evil words, lay all those things aside, he says. And then desire, desire to grow in Jesus, to grow in the word, to grow in the simple gospel. This is the reason he uses the word milk there. I used it last week if you were here in a way, but anyway, he uses that, the simple gospel, and grow in that grace Peter used the term babes, right? As babies, basically. Desire the milk of the word. Desire that. The simple, simple gospel, guys. The gospel of Jesus is so simple. It's a, a child can understand it. It's not just for the intellectual. You know, I got to get an education just so I can understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, it's not for the intellectual. And Peter encourages them to keep the main thing, the main thing in those first three verses as he leads into what he's going to say. Keep the main thing, the main thing, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then just grow in that. And grow in the grace that's given to you through that. Taste the simple, simple gospel and receive the grace. You know what the gospel is? You know, the the greatest verse used by evangelists all over the world For hundreds of years is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How simple is that? It is a simple gospel, you see. He said, grow there. Start there and grow there. You know, too many want to make the gospel, a salvation, complicated. Unfortunately, you see it within organized, I'm going to call it religion. Organized religion, they want to make it complicated. They want to make it about works. You got to do this. You got to do that. Do this and do that. And then maybe if you do enough of this and that, you'll receive the grace. Maybe then you will get the grace of God that he's speaking about here. That's man's religion, church. Peter's time, the the Jews knew a work. Well, they were a perfect example, this Jewish sect. They were a perfect example of those works and those ritual religion. And he knew that that was not the relationship with Christ. But the Jews were, they had the washings, they had the different sacrifices, all the laws they had to keep. Peter reveals to them, Jew and Gentile alike, these new believers, just come simply. Just come. That's what I tell those in the community I'm reaching out to minister to him. I said, there's no strings attached. Anything pastor does when he goes out and speaks, is I don't got to try to hook him and drag him in here. I got some strings attached. No. I said, but simply come. Come check it out. Hear the word of God. So let Jesus change your life. You've tried everything else. Try God. You know, you've tried everything else. But anyway, Peter reveals to him, like I say, to come simply. And he's going to tell us to come alive. You come alive, church. We come as living stones. 
building, a building that's built upon the solid cornerstone of Jesus. That, that song, cornerstone, right? That's how we're to come. In verse 5 now, pick it up from there. I'm sorry, verse 4. He says, coming to him as to a living stone. Speaking of Jesus, he's a living stone. Coming to him as a li uh, living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, Peter says. You also now as living stones, calling us, these believers, you also as living stones are being built up in a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. By the way, that's very important. Through Jesus Christ. He says you're coming to Jesus, coming to Jesus. By the way, this Jesus is that stone, that living stone. He says, come simply, though. The Savior lives. He's alive. Come to him. Yes, he was rejected by the world. We know Jesus was rejected by many, persecuted, crucified upon the cross, that we might have salvation. But guess what? He tells us here also, chosen by God and his precious. He literally is chosen. Come to that living stone, he says. Jesus, God's only begotten son, precious, alive too, a living stone, our cornerstone of faith, our cornerstone. You know, many religions, world religions out there, have cornerstones of faith. They're not Jesus. They have these cornerstones. Take Buddha, Buddhism. Well, Buddha is the cornerstone of their faith, if you were to look at that. Muhammad is the cornerstone to Islam. And then Brahman as the cornerstone to the Hindu religion. And then if you get into the Greek gods and mythology and polytheism, that's what's called many gods, polytheism there, they all, you know, they have their cornerstone also. But what's the one difference? All those cornerstones of all these other religions or cults even, they're dead. Church, they're dead. Peter says, the alive, Jesus is an alive cornerstone. Some never lived even. You know, all those Greek gods and goddesses and stuff. The cornerstone of cults. Take them, for instance, the LDS church, the Mormon church. Their cornerstone is Joseph Smith. Guess what? He's dead. Are you dead? I'm sorry. Graveyard dead. Buried, you know. How about the cornerstone of the Jehovah Witness? Charles Russell. He's dead. They built it upon that. I could go on and on and on with these cults. The Unitarian, Universal Unitarian. I can't remember the guy's name. He, he's dead. They're all dead, but he said, no, Jesus is alive. See, Peter knew Jesus was alive. He saw him after, after his resurrection, man. He was one of the first disciples that, that he met with, uh, met Jesus there. He's alive. He's seen him. He spoke with him. He ate with him. He, he re got restored by Jesus, too. Remember that wonderful, wonderful time on the Sea of Galilee? And, oh, Peter had denied Jesus three times. But now he comes to him and restores him again. He knew Jesus was alive. Jesus was not dead. He calls him a building stone, a building stone for the believer that would build the church. Tell them to come to him. In verse 5 there, read that again. You also now, you individually, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You also as these living stones. You know, this is, the, I, I just imagine this. Anybody here done masonry work? I did a lot of brick laying. I hate laying block. Those 8, 8, 16, it's terrible. You lay brick, man. Brick's so pretty and it's so light. And you thump, thump, thump. Laid a lot of brick and you build these walls, right? Just beautiful. This is kind of the picture that Peter gives. He says, you as believers in the church, now you're these living stones also. You're to be alive. Not dead in a pew somewhere, right? Not dead in a pew, but you're to be alive. Peter's picture here is God building. He's building this spiritual temple 
with all his believers. And guess what? We're all upon the one cornerstone. We're building the house of God. Comprised of living stones. Comprised of Christians, you know? Each one of those bricks. Boom, boom, boom. Kind of like that wall there we've been using on our screen, you know? Each one of those comprising more and more of the house. Those who come, though, he says, you got to come first. It's a spiritual house, a spiritual house. See, the Jews in Israel had their spiritual house, right? They had their spiritual house as the temple for thousands of years. Well, the temple built, torn down, built, torn down, <laughs> that kind of thing. By the way, the Jews don't have a temple right now. If we see them start to build a temple, look up. Your redemption is nigh because we've studied Revelation. We know what takes place there. But anyway, not getting into that. They had this temple. And the Christians do also. But see, it's not a building. That's why this is this structure is not the church. It's within each individual. It's not a building. Now, that spiritual house that is being built is a temple within ourself, God living within, residing within his people. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are individually, guys, the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you, dwells within us, each and every one of us, each believer. Do we consider or do you consider your bodies as God church? Because basically that's what the word tells us. Your body as his church. The building is not the church. If you consider the building the church, and there's one down there and there's one over there, no, it's what's within that building. It's the individual believer. Your personal relationship. You know, one thing I speak about all the time is that personal relationship we need with our Lord. So powerful. You know, when uh, you write out those prayer cards, um, I hope you're praying for those cards, too. I hope you're praying those same prayers. That's a personal relationship, you see. Don't trust in, trust in us to have that relationship. Obviously, personal relationship and then a relationship as a group. This is where Peter knows they need their sink. Where is our identity? That's the key. Here at Calvary Chapel New Day, Peter says you've been being built up. He's telling them they're being built up. To be a holy priesthood and offer your life. You also are living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, accepted to God through Jesus Christ, he says. Spiritual sacrifices. What is that sacrifice? Right? A spiritual sacrifice? He says it right there. Lives. Lives that are acceptable. We're alive. We don't have to die as a sacrifice as Jesus did. We don't have to go uh, kill an animal and bleed it out as a sacrifice. We're alive. Our lives are being acceptable. That's a sacrifice. The Christian life is a personal sacrifice. Not the sacrifice of your brother sitting next to you, your sister, or your wife, or your husband, or whatever it is. It is your own personal sacrifice to glorify Jesus. Denying the desires of self. That is our personal sacrifice. We sacrifice those things unto the Lord to glorify Jesus, to be acceptable to God the Father. Not dying, though. Living as that sacrifice and more so alive, man. Alive. Stir it up to be an obedient to God's word. You know, 1 Samuel 15, 22. It'll be on the screen. So Samuel said... Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? He asked that question. Has he? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice even, and to heed than the fat of the ram. In Psalm 51, 16 and 17, David knew this too. King David, he wrote, For you do not desire sacrifice or else I'd give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit got to come broken, you know. Be broken before the Lord. You should be broken every day before the Lord, really. 
We are broken people in reality. A broken and contrite heart, just a loving heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise, David says. See, all this Peter is telling them in verse 5. It's through Jesus Christ, though, right? Acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, not any man, not some figurehead, not through a building. All this has to be, well, through Jesus Christ. I got a commentator here, Grudem, and he says, the believer is his own priest before God, and you are. He does not need any mediator except his great priest, Jesus. There can no longer be an elite priesthood with claims of special access to God. I got no special access, guys. I don't know about you. I don't know any man has a special access to God or special privileges in worship or in fellowship with God. The access is through Jesus Christ as our mediator in that personal, a personal commitment is necessary for that. When we pray, when we seek, why do we pray in Jesus' name? Because he is our intercessor. 1 Timothy 2.5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, it says. I'm sorry, I got a pack falling off here. Give me one second. Maybe it will stay. I'll slip it in my pocket. How's that action? Okay, I don't want that to hit the floor. One mediator, church. One. Pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Therefore, there is one God, one mediator between God and man. Man, G Christ Jesus. As I said with those prayer cards, we love those prayer cards. Please fill them out. But understand, we're going through that one mediator too. If you've got prayers within your heart, you, feel, you want to put up prayers, Jesus is there for you too. He hears you just as well as he hears anyone else. You know, the question is, is Jesus your mediator? Are you that living stone being built upon that foundation in identity in Jesus? Go on to verse 6. Therefore, it is also contained in the Scripture. Peter's going to use Scripture. I love it. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. And then he says in verse 7, Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, non-believing is what that really means, those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And then he says in verse 8, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed, by the way. Interesting. We'll get to that part in a minute. They also were appointed there. Peter uses God's word to start with. I want to point that out. Now, Peter's use of God's word was the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament. He was part of the writer in the New Testament, right? But he used God's word. Guys, we want to use God's word. He was using Old Testament scripture. You don't have to verbatim be able to quote scripture, but you know the pretense. You want to use God's word. The use of God's word, see, he, he chose in verses his own to make his point. The power of the gospel, the power of God's word is in the gospel, is of God. It is the power. Use God's word as you speak to people. You know, I always tell them, say, well, the Bible says this. And paraphrase it. You know, you know the precepts. The truth, truth that really will not and cannot be denied. Many times it'll change conversation. You may not get invited back to that party ever again, I'll guarantee you, because you said, well, the Bible says, oh, can't have him now. I used to get invited a lot of places. <laughs> That's okay, I'm invited right here, man. <laughs> can't be denied. Romans 1.16. Paul writes, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation. That is the power of God to salvation. It's the gospel. It's not your words. It's not my words. 
For everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, it says, that is the power of the gospel, is God and for salvation. Now, Peter uses three different scriptures here, by the way, as you see that. The first one in verse 6, the second one in verse 7, and the third one in verse 8. Those two are comprised between Isaiah and Psalms. And he compares them, though. He compares each as a prophecy fulfilled through Jesus Christ. A chief cornerstone, behold, I lay a, uh, in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes in him will by no means be put to shame. Um, prophecy fulfilled. In verse, uh, in verse 7, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Prophecy fulfilled. A stone of the stumbling and a rock of offense, a prophecy fulfilled again. Do you guys have those little stars in your Bible next to those verses? Do you have those stars on the side there? I have these little stars. And if that star is filled in dark, that means the prophecy has been fulfilled. Now, if the star is just the outline of a star, it hasn't been fulfilled yet. <laughs> it will be fulfilled. Kind of a neat, uh, neat thing to have within your Bibles. But he uses these two examples. For the ones who believe, he says, and obey the word, Jesus is precious. I hope Jesus is precious to you. He's precious to me. He's everything to me. He says, for those ones who believe and they obey the word, Jesus is precious. And for those who do not believe or obey, he says they are disobedient. Jesus is a stone of stumbling. You're going to trip over him, man. You're constantly going to trip over him. He's going to be a rock of offense. They cannot accept this Jesus. And by the way, they will not accept his believers either. They will not accept you because Jesus has become that rock of offense. Guys, we can divide all of mankind. This is interesting, you know. There's some things you can just divide. Okay, this is that. Black is black and white is white, right? Oh, man, they're going to get me for being gracious or something when I said that. No, we can divide all of mankind into two categories. The ones who Jesus is precious to and the ones who hate him. There you go. You got it. The ones are precious and the ones who Jesus is an offense to. The ones who build upon the truth of Jesus Christ and the ones who will be crushed by it. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21, if you would, please. We're going to read a little bit out of Matthew and what Jesus says. Jesus tells a beautiful parable here. Well, actually, it's kind of a harsh parable for some. can be beautiful for the believer, though. Chapter 21 of Matthew. We're going to begin in verse 33. Now, Jesus is uh, standing before those Pharisees and Sadducees and those in the Jewish sect and so he's speaking to them, and he tells them a parable. He says, hear another parable. There was a certain landowner who owned, who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it and dug a, vine, uh, a wine press in it and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers, and he went into a far country. Now, when the vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dresser that they might receive its fruit, the owner of the vineyard. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Oh, they're nice guys. Again, he sent another, other servants, other servants, not just one, other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, they'll respect my son. Hmm, the son of God. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said uh, among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill and seize his inheritance. So they took him, cast him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vine vineyard comes, what will he do to these vine dressers? That Jesus asked these Pharisees. Oh, they said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to another vine dresser who will render to him the fruits in their season. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected 
has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it's a marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to the nations, bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone, he says, whoever falls on this stone, now they'll be broken. But on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Notice the star at verse 44 if you have a Bible like mine that has the star. Not filled in, is it? Prophecy is not fulfilled yet, church. They haven't been ground into powder. <laughs> That'll be odd. Pretty interesting. A bunch of powder laying around, I guess. Anyway, it's an unfulfilled prophecy for now. They will be crushed. Going back to it. Whoever falls on this stone, in verse 44, whoever falls on this stone will be broken. But on whomever it falls, it will grind into powder. Where do we fall, church, you see? He says there, do we fall on top of the stone? We get broken there. We fall, and we're broken, but guess what? God can put us back together, and he can put together a new creation. Broken, but repairable. Or do we fall under the stone, unbelieving, crushed into powder? Where is your identity? Is your identity in Jesus on top of that stone? A little bit broken, right? Or are we under that stone? Is Jesus precious to you? Jesus needs to be precious. Building upon the cornerstone. Where are we at in that? Is Jesus who we're building upon or is it the world? Are we obedient or disobedient to the word? Where do we fall? Peter says in verse 8, go back to 1 Peter. The very end of verse 8 there. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed, guys. They were appointed. They were appointed to the truth. All men, since Jesus, have been appointed to the truth, to hear the truth. And the truth has gone out over and over and over in every nation, every tongue. The gospel is preached. They were appointed to the truth. But they chose the alternative, you see. They chose not to hear it. They turned to, instead to, to hear the lies and corruption and the lust of self and go, wow, this is what I want. I want the world, not the truth. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it'd be on the screen. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he's long-suffering towards us. Maybe you have a child. Maybe you have a family member. Maybe you have a friend. Maybe you got a wife, a husband that doesn't know the Lord. By the way, He's long-suffering towards us. He's patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, to come and just fall on that cornerstone of Jesus. It really is. It's an individual choice. We have to understand that. But speaking the gospel and praying for those can lead them to fall upon that stone. Go to verse 9 now. It says, but you are a chosen generation, identity in Jesus, by the way. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Wow. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who, is not, who had not obtained mercy before, but now have attained mercy, Peter says. Peter tells us, he tells these churches there, you know what he's telling them in reality? I break it down to this. Stand tall, churches, in your identity in Jesus. Stand tall. Here you are. You're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. His own special people. Stand tall in that identity in Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone of your faith, and stand upon it and stand tall there. If Jesus is precious to you, if he truly is precious, under, and you understand the identity in Jesus in you, stand tall in that, guys. Stand tall in all ways. Speak truth. No matter when the lies are told, speak the truth. You are a chosen priesthood. 
We are chosen priesthood. You know, we are priests. We are saints. You know, they got the canonized saints and the statues. The Bible says all God's children are his saints, by the way. And we are the priests, too. It speaks about that in the Bible. And we're holy, set apart. He says you're a holy priesthood, set apart for Jesus. Jesus is special people. You're the Christians. Stand tall, please. In these times, stand tall. Your chosen generation, the generation we're in. There's a reason we're in this generation. There's a reason we're Christians in this particular generation. Some of you are a little older. Some of you are a little younger. There's a reason we're here, and it is to stand tall. Chosen generation. Those things that Peter mentions here, they were exclusive to the Jews in Israel at one time before Jesus Christ. That chosen priesthood, that was all come from the Jewish sect. Before Jesus came, there were those chosen priests, the Levites working within the temple. Now, now he's saying they're the property of all who believe in Christ. All who believe, whether you're Jew or Greek, all people. In Galatians 3, 26, 28. For you are all the sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I hope you put on Christ, guys. There is neither Jew, there is nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Stand tall, church. There is no racial separation. There is no ethnic separation. There is no class separation. There is no gender separation. You are all in Christ Jesus. Don't let the lies come at you. The lies of Satan should not cause God's children to waver. We know the truth. As the lies are spoke, as they're trying to have the lies literally attack and change our children, you understand that's the purpose of it. I think I told you that before. The children will turn against the parents and against the grandparents because they know more. No, those lies of Satan don't waver. You're his special people, by the way. There is no difference in racial, ethnic, class, gender, separation, none of that. You know, years ago, uh, when I was a missions junkie, I spent several uh, several tours, I guess you say, they're only two-week tours, but anyway, over in Kenya. And it was amazing. This one time uh, there, we're doing this project. We're building one of the first uh, uh, senior high schools down in one of the slums. And we're working on this thing. And we'd have lunch, and they made up a bunch of food for all, would hire Kenyan workers, you know. And the one guy said to me, he said, hey, brother, brother Dennis. They call you brother. I love that little roll in it. Brother Dennis. When I die and go to heaven, will I go to the same heaven as you? And I looked at him and I said, wow. What do you mean? He says, will I be in the same heaven as you? And so anyway, earlier that day, I'd cut my hand really bad and I had it duct tape around it. And this African uh, man, Otumbo was his name. That's the only one I could ever remember, Otumbo. He had cut his fingers real bad, and I bandaged those up for him. And I told him, hey, you come over here. I took his bandages off, and I squeezed his fingers real hard so it bleed. And I took mine off, and I squeezed it right there really hard. And I said, you see that? I showed him his hand and my hand. I said, that's the same blood. You see the color of that blood? That's the blood Jesus shed for each of us. But they literally thought over there because a white man would go to heaven first. no. There is no ethnic, no racial, class, gender, separation, none of that. We're chosen and set apart for Jesus. His holy people, Peter says. The holy and obedient people, that's the important part. And our, our identity needs to be in Jesus and him alone and him crucified. Amen? In Galatians 2.20, I want to read that again. It's going to be up on the screen. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Been crucified with Christ. Have you been crucified with Christ? 
sitting here and thinking about that. Have you been crucified with, with Christ? Are you building your life upon Jesus? Do you call Jesus precious? Is Jesus really precious to you? Are you building your life upon that cornerstone, that solid rock, that foundation? Are you doing that? Or maybe, maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're, you know what, I'm not doing that very well, Pastor. That's okay. There's always a great time to say, I want to do that in a greater way. I want to build my life upon that cornerstone. I want Jesus to be more precious in my life. I want to be crucified with Christ. I don't need the things of the world anymore. I need to follow Jesus, and you want to recommit your life to the Lord. I want to give you that opportunity right now. If everybody just close their heads, close their heads, close their eyes and bow their heads, please. Ah, don't close your mind to this. If you want to recommit your life to the Lord, and renew in obedience and renew in identity in your Savior. Just pray along this line. Say, Lord Jesus, I know you as my Savior. And Lord, I haven't been living that set apart holiness before you. I haven't been obedient, Lord. And Lord, I, you haven't been very precious to me. So many other things, all my other preciouses, they were so much more precious than you, Jesus. But today, I want to recommit my life to you, Lord. I want to I want to tell you that I love you and you are precious. I give you my life again, God. Use it for your glory, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're sitting here this morning or you're out there online and you haven't received Jesus as your Savior, I want to pray for that too. If everybody just pray for those who don't know, Lord. Just pray this way. Say, Jesus, I come to you this morning and I want to receive you. Receive you as my Lord and Savior, knowing that you died upon a cross. And the third day you rose again, that I might have salvation. Lord Jesus, is a very simple gospel, and I'm receiving it in that simplicity. Just the pure milk of that gospel, Lord. Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And I give you my life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you said that first prayer and you're sitting here or you're out online, I say hallelujah. Jesus will help you all the way with it. Let me tell you what. He's so precious. And if you gave your life to the Lord for the first time, come forward after service. I'd love to pray with you. If you're out online, I just tell you every week, I tell them, go find a good Bible teaching church. Learn the word of God. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you. Thank you for your word. and Thank you for the blessing of your word, God. Uh, you are, Jesus, so precious. Lord, thank you for the gospel and how simple it is that we could profess the truth to all we see. In Jesus' name, amen.